Welcome, friends, and happy Sabbath. Today is a special day as we open God's Word. Our sermon title today is entitled, When It Pays to Be Poor. Welcome to the Bay Roberts Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're thankful that you could join us on our live stream each and every Sabbath. And you can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash bayrobertssda. Feel free to join us as we worship together this morning. And uh, before we begin, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful and special time that we can come together to invite your spirit to be close to us that we may learn at your feet. Father, as we, as we dig deep into your word this morning, we ask that your spirit will open our hearts and minds. And Father, I ask that uh, you will speak through me, this weak vessel. May the words that come through come directly from your throne of grace, that you may be glorified. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, as I indicated earlier, our sermon title is entitled, When It Pays to Be Poor. And our message is mainly focused on the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew in chapter 5. Now, the Gospel of Matthew is known as the Gospel of the King, for Matthew portrays Jesus Christ as God's chosen King for Israel. He answers three basic questions that anyone would ask about a king. Where did he come from? What does he believe? And of course, what can he do? Chapters 1 to 4 of Matthew present the person of the king, his background, his birth, and his baptism. Jesus is portrayed as the Son of God, sent to be the Savior of the entire world. Chapters 5 to 7 in the book of Matthew describes the principles of this king, his beliefs, Jesus' goals for our lives. And moving forward to chapters 8 to 10, reveal the power of this king, power over demons, power over disease, and yes, even power over death. And that is something that this world knows very well. It's about death and disease, and yes, there are even demons in this world. Although there are these evil entities in the world, Matthew presents Jesus as this perfect king, this perfect king, and the nation of Israel was ready for a king and the restoration of God's kingdom. Now, what did they want in a king? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Well, in those days, the Pharisees, the Pharisees wanted to know exactly what the, the king could do for them. The Pharisees claimed that freedom would come as a result of turning back to the traditions of the fathers. The Sadducees urged the need to update their religion, become more liberal and contemporary. The Essenes taught that God's people were to live a holy life and be secluded from the world around them. And the Zealots sought to restore Israel's freedom by revolt and force. The same factions of voices clamor for the following today. We see it in our world today. Yes, folks, there are Pharisees today. Yes, there are Sadducees today. And yes, there are Essenes today. And yes, there are Zealots today. There are many factions all vying and saying that what, there is, what their way is and what they are teaching is the truth. But are they? There can be only one truth, folks. There are those who say what we need is the good old religion of our fathers and of our founders. Some want the church to come out of the 1800s and reconform to the standard of the world's thinking to help our image. I wonder if that works. And there are some who strain the truth away of keeping oneself unspotted from the world, forming almost a secluded religious community. And others... They urge social zeal and so-called Christian revolt against evil and the establishment of God's kingdom today and now. 
So who are we to believe amongst these many voices clamoring for our attention? Ask yourself, is there any word from the Lord today in this dark world we live? Is there any word from the Lord today? His answer is yes, absolutely, and it's found in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount beginning in chapter 5. It is Christ's own description of what he wants his followers to be, radically different than religious and irreligious nominal Christians and pagans of the day, and even for today. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and we'll begin with verse 1. And I'd like to read the Beatitudes as Christ laid them out in the Bible. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. And uh, verse 5 begins, there's a little subtitle on the top of my Bible here. On chapter 5 it says, The Sermon on the Mount. Verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now this is Christ's own words, own words to his children. Do they have an importance in our lives individually and as a church today? Well, immediately following his baptism and victory in the wilderness of temptation, Jesus began to announce the good news of the kingdom. And when he announced this good news, this good news on the Sermon on the Mount, it was to relay to the people of his day that there were many parallels in what he was saying to them and what would be in our day. The Mount of Beatitudes parallels Mount Sinai. A greater than Moses has come to explain the greater meaning of the law. The saving work of Jesus is a new exodus. The twelve apostles form the nucleus of this new Israel. The yoke of the Torah becomes the yoke of Christ. Now that's good news. The yoke of Christ. And you know something? Christ says, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. For it is burden. the burden is easy and it is light. What did Jesus say, or what did the Bible say, shall we say? And let me rephrase that. What does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23? Well, let's turn there. Matthew 4, 23 says this. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And let's continue on, and let's go back a few verses to verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Greek word for repentance is metonia. Means, it means a complete change of mind, a complete change of heart, a complete change of course, as it were, in one's life. It's necessary because this law of Jesus has, like his law from Sinai, two purposes. It first shows us the extreme demand of righteousness, that none of us can obey the law or please God by oneself. 
This directs us to Christ, to be justified. And secondly, it shows the Christian how to live as a Christian. Now, that's good news. The Reformers summarized it like this. The law sends us to Christ to be justified, and Christ sends us back to the law to be sanctified. Amen? Neither is apart from Christ. You can't have one without the other. The Sermon on the Mount is given to those who are followers of Jesus Christ, those who have experienced the new birth, those who have accepted the gospel and in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. Amen? It does not serve as a formula of reaching heaven, of earning God's blessing or instructions on how to be a Christian. What does it do then? The sermon is speaking to those who have found the pearl of great price. Have you ever wondered what the pearl of great price is? Have you ever desired this pearl of great price? Well, you know something. It says who, these are the people who are planning to be at the wedding feast, the wedding feast of Jesus, who live by faith in Jesus Christ. And that, yes, folks, is to live by faith in this world. No matter what's going on around you, no matter if there is wars and rumors of wars, if there's adverse weather conditions, or if there are signs that things are going to get really bad and things are going to get drastic, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because Jesus is saying, live by faith. Live by faith. You know something? There's only one way we can live by faith. It's because we are under the grace of Jesus Christ, who freely gives it to us. So Jesus is saying, I invite you to join me as we journey to discover the profoundly simple yet exhaustible wealth of my teachings. Not my teachings, of Jesus' teachings. To follow and be profoundly impacted and forever changed by this teaching, by these teachings of Jesus Christ. We begin with the text of the most familiar of Christ's teachings of the Beatitudes. Now in future presentations, I'm going to expound upon these other Beatitudes, and uh, together at the end, it'll be a sermon series. But today, I would, before we begin, I'd like to recommend to you reading from the, a chapter of a book called Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Now, this is a, a book that goes through the Beatitudes and uh, really brings out uh, the treasures that's found in these words. Sometimes we can take the Bible and just have a surface reading. But God wants us to search as for hidden treasure. Search the scriptures. Search them for that treasure that will change your life, that will give you that pearl of great price that you will be found in Jesus. Amen? Now, are the collections in these Beatitudes, are these words, are these idealistic sayings, beautiful to read like poetry, but impossible to practice? Are they a description of true righteousness in theory, or is this something that it can be impact us in real life, in today's world? Can they be both? Those of you who get or have gotten water from a spring know that if you have dirty water coming out of your faucet, you know, it's not necessarily time to replace your faucet, is it? It's time to clean the reservoir or the cistern or even the pipes. This is what Jesus requires of me. This is exactly what Jesus requires of you and me. What does he require? For us, for his will to do in me what I can't do. That's his will for us, to allow him to clean us from the inside out. And his commands are also promises. You know, Jesus is not describing eight different groups of his followers. He rather gives eight qualities that he wants to be in each of his followers. He wants them to be poor in spirit. He wants them to be pure in heart. He wants them to be mourning and hungering. What does that mean? He wants them to be meek and merciful. He wants them to be persecuted. Did I say that? 
Did I say that? He wants us to be persecuted? Jesus actually wants us to be persecuted. But that's not to say that he brings us into uh, areas in the world that, so that we can unnecessarily be persecuted. But he wants us to exercise the faith that when we are persecuted, we will be that living testament of a risen Savior, a risen Lord, that we may testify that Jesus is our King and our Savior. It is his description of righteousness. It's his righteousness. It's his prescription for happiness in your life and in my life. There's always a close connection between holiness and happiness. Have you ever seen Christians going around with a very sad face? And they're down and out all the time. And they're despondent. And they're dejected. And they're just dragging their, li their lives around each and every day. Is that God's will? For his people. Is that God's will for you? You can have that joyous, that living, that vibrant connection with him today. Even today, he's willing to change your, your life so that all you see around you is a, an opportunity to share Jesus because Jesus lives in you. Amen? There is no happiness apart from God, is there? There can't be. Because God is life. God is love. God is joy. And yes, God is peace. Jesus begins each beatitude with the word blessed. Blessed. You know, folks, I can't think of a better word than the word blessed, can you? You know, if someone blesses you, you know, if a, if a, uh, a boyfriend or a fiancé comes to the father of, the, of the, his daughter and says, uh, Sir, I'd like to have your daughter's hand in marriage. And if that father gives his blessing, does, that, does not that give this fiancé such joy and wondrous peace in his heart that he has been accepted by the father? Well, it's the same with God. God wants to bless you. He wants to give you so much so much that even the gates of heaven cannot contain it all. That's a lot. You know, we can have that joy. We can have that peace. We can have that, have that happiness. There's always a close connection. And let me repeat that. There's always a close connection between holiness and happiness. Happiness can only come from God. Happiness cannot come from things of this world. Happiness cannot come from the material things that you have. You know, the more you have does not necessarily translate into happiness, does it? What we need more of is Christ. More of Christ. Did you ever hear that song before, More About Jesus? More about Jesus on his throne. More about Jesus. That's what we need, folks. More about Jesus. The Greek word for blessed is makarios, and it just simply means, in the simplest form, happiness. If you react to situations and circumstances in the spirit of the Beatitudes, then your life will be happy. As the psalmist says, great peace which they which love thy Lord, sorry, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So, what this text is saying, no matter what happens to you, if you truly understand this understanding that Christ gives to us in regarding blessed, that if we are blessed, that they are more, that they more blessed are they that are meek. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst for righteousness. We can be blessed in any circumstance. It does not matter what you are going through. Jesus will bless you in the storm. Amen. And I know. There are people, folks who are watching or listening on Living Word Radio right now that face storms each and every day of their lives. And you know, there's not a human, not a human that's not afflicted with some storm in their life because that's the world we live in, a world of sin. However, no matter what storm you face, God is there. He wants to be there. He wants to live in you so that you can have that understanding, that heavenly attribute 
of clearness of eyes where the scales fall off and you are at peace knowing no matter what, Lord, no matter what I face, no matter what downturn there is in my life, I will turn to you. I won't complain. I won't murmur. I will turn to you and I will grab your hand and I will plead with you, Father, increase my faith. And you know something, folks? He will. He increases your faith when you ask, when you follow him. You know, there's more than this, though. Jesus is not just describing how we may feel. He most importantly is telling us what God thinks of us. And because of this, we are blessed and blessed and blessed. You know, he doesn't think of us as an absolute. He doesn't think, think of us as an objective judgment. He thinks of us as a living, breathing soul that he created. And you know, you've heard this before. If there was only one person left on the face of this earth, Christ would die and be risen, rose again because of that one person. And that one person, folks, you know something, is you. And that one person is me. He loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love. Let's read Matthew 5, verse 3 again. Matthew 5, verse 3. And this is the focus of our message today, really. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I'd like to read a, a, a quote I read in a book one time. And uh, I just taped it in my Bible here. It says this. As something strange and new, these words fall upon the ears of the wondering multitude. Such teaching is contrary to all they have ever heard from priest or rabbi. They see in it nothing to flatter their pride or to feed their ambitious hopes. But there is about this new teacher a power that holds them spellbound. The sweetness of divine love flows from his very presence as the fragrance from the flower. You know, my daughter came to me just today and she ran into the house bursting with joy. She said, Dad, Dad, the tulips have finally opened. The tulips have finally opened. Now, if you understand anything about Newfoundland weather, uh, it's hard to grow anything in Newfoundland because of our short summer. So when you see flowers starting to bloom, it's an exciting thing, and definitely an exciting thing for my daughter. And uh, I appreciated that because, you know, what is the sweetness of God? And when Christ relayed these wonderful words of life, these Beatitudes to the folks that were listening at the time, it was as a sweet fragrance that was permeated, permeated the entire multitude. What? powerful witness it was to see that to hear about changed lives because of the words spoken by Jesus blessed are the poor in spirit Jesus begins here because unless this one principle is settled in our hearts we lose out on the blessing of his kingdom this is the same principle as the message he gave to Laodicea now we often hear of Laodicea in the Bible, and it's, it's a very negative thing because they're, they're lukewarm. They're cold, as it were. They have lost their first love. But Jesus is telling us that this is a message that he is giving to us, the same as Laodicea. They claim to be rich and increased with goods, but they were actually poor, wretched, and blind. Unless they realized their bankruptcy, they could not be helped. Now, this is the answer. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does it mean when Christ says, blessed are the poor in spirit? Well, again, if they did not realize their bankruptcy, they were lost. They were lost. To be poor in spirit means that you recognize your object poverty. Not material poverty. Spiritual poverty. Not to be a poor spirit, but to realize that you're spiritually poor, that you need Christ. 
that you need him every day, that you need to drink large drafts of that living water that can only come from Christ. Jesus opens the treasures of his grace to the beggars. He spreads a feast for the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And you can find that in Luke chapter 4, verse 21. According to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 37, there are great riches in poverty. Now, what do I mean? In the world we live in today, if, someone, if we see someone in poverty, we lament over them. That we say, that poor soul, how did they ever get to be in such abject poverty, I wonder. But according to Proverbs 13, 7, there are great riches in poverty. But what poverty is he talking about? It is because Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor. That we through his poverty might be rich. He proclaimed in Nazareth synagogue so many years ago, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Amen? To those who realize that they are sinners, who deserve nothing but the wrath of God, who do not belong anywhere except in the shoes of the publican, who with bowed head cry, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Do we have that heart, folks? Do we have that heart cry that we are sinners and in need of Christ? I know I need that every day because if I do not have that understanding that I need Christ in this way, then every day you can just simply drift further and further and further and farther away from him. And he's the one you need. He's the one I need. I need Christ. And I know you do too. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about, to be poor in spirit, recognizing our need that we need Christ because we are poor and we are wretched spiritually. We need him each and every day. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul I to the mountain fly, Wash me, Savior, or I die. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Without Christ, I am nothing. He alone can save me from this world and from myself. It's only through Christ. And that's what he intends to do. That's what he wants to do for you, friend. To the poor in spirit, to these alone, is the kingdom of God given. Amen. It is a gift as absolutely free as it is utterly undeserved. There's nothing we do to merit it. It's given to those who know that they can offer nothing. Nothing. That song, that hymn, not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ and everything. All they can do is cry to God for help. And you know something? God does not turn away from one cry for help. Not one. Theirs is the kingdom now. Jesus taught that his kingdom was a, was a present reality, which, which we can receive, which we can inherit, which we can enter into right now. He taught that then, and it means the same for us today. You don't have to wait for it. Amen? Amen. You don't have to wait for it. The kingdom of Christ is present now, just as it was 2,000 years ago. Because it has more to do with a principle than a place. Amen. The kingdom is more a fellowship with Christ and people than, than people with wings for flying and lines that don't bite. That's not what it's about. That's why Christ could say, my kingdom is come. My kingdom is come. Doesn't mean that his kingdom is going to come. It doesn't mean that it's a future thing. His kingdom is come. He's come for you, folks. He's come for you, friend. He's come for me. Blessed are the poor in spirit when we recognize our spiritual weakness, our frailties. Surrender that to Christ and he will change our hearts into living, breathing, beating, full of love, witnessing hearts for Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
And his kingdom comes in you in three ways. Three ways. And the first way is this. One, accept God's estimate of yourself. Not your estimate of yourself or my estimate of myself, but God's estimate of yourself. The Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. You hear that song before? No, not one. No, not one. There's none righteous and that we must be born again. We must be born again. But the Bible also says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and that God accepts us as he accepts Jesus the Son that all heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. Just one sinner and all heaven rejoices. Can you imagine the multitude of people when they repent, when they repent what absolute joy is in heaven. That is something to behold. That is something to behold. To accept God's estimate of you individually will enable you both to sense your utter poverty, that's your spiritual poverty, not the material poverty, and indebtedness, and at the same time, your infinite value because of God's love. God's love. God's love for you. God loves you, and he loves me. You know, this world has turned, uh, by and large, has turned their back on God. But yet, God still loves them. He would not have one single solitary soul to perish. Not one. Our choice is to choose Jesus. Amen. Our choice is to choose Jesus. Now, how else does the kingdom come to you? Number two. Yield yourself to Christ every day. Every day drink from the springs of living water that comes from his word, from his holy word, words of life, words of joy, words of peace, words that will give direction in your life in this dark world that we live in today. Words that will bring you to the feet of Jesus. And that's where we need to be. You know, and if we don't, we lose perspective of the value of God that, that God places on us. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But we know that with Christ, all things are possible. Amen. He alone is the author and finisher of our faith. He will fulfill the righteousness of the law in us as the word of God transforms our mind to be like Christ. The words of Christ will transform our lives. The words of Christ will change us into a new brother, a new sister, a new man, a new woman, a new child of God. And the third way the kingdom can come to you is this. Look for opportunities to serve others. The principles of Christ's kingdom are, are not abstract. They are tangible and they are relevant. The Apostle Paul counsels that every Christian ought to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think or to let each esteem others better than themselves and by love serve one another. I am not to think myself higher than you. You are not to think yourself higher than me. We are on the level ground at the foot of the cross where each one of us looks up and sees that it's only through the crucified Christ, the risen Christ, that we even have life. We even have breath to live this life that God has given to us. Folks, it's as simple as that. We are in this together. Christ created us. He wants us to live with him eternity for eternity, for the ceaseless ages of eternity. What does he want for, from us in return? It's very simple. To choose him. To choose him. To choose his ways. And to surrender our wills to him. That's it. 
Christ does the rest. Christ will change this stony heart and give me a heart of flesh, a heart that can love one another, a heart that can serve humanity. For there's a lot of humanity out there that needs Christ. That's his will for us as we surrender our lives to him to go out there and to be the hands and feet of Jesus as we minister for him to people that they can too see this love of Jesus, that they too can live for eternity with Jesus. To be poor in spirit means that we recognize our obligation to one another as fellow members of God's family. For the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. And Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. And that one is Jesus Christ. The first Adam the first Adam was tested in the Garden of Eden, and he failed. The last Adam, the Bible talks about the last Adam. Who's the last Adam? The last Adam is Christ. That's right. The last Adam, Christ was tested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and yes, he succeeded. Amen. The first Adam failed. The second Adam, Christ, succeeded. The first Adam took that which was not his. The last Adam gave his all. The first Adam ate fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, bringing a curse to humanity. We see it all around us today. This curse, this sin curse. And the last Adam, because he hung on a tree, makes the fruits of the Spirit available as a blessing of humanity. Because of Adam's sin, we all must die. Because of Christ's death and obedience, we all may partake of his life, his resurrected life. Christ's kingdom has to do with salvation. And the text says, Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus Christ. In closing, we have just gleaned a small glimpse of what the beatitude means when it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, that they spiritually, that they recognize that they are spiritually poor, they are spiritually destitute, they reach out to this risen Savior, and they can have life and life abundant. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. And these shall reign in life. You meet every day with all it has to offer, with confidence, because you have committed all to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think. That's found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. God originally created you to have dominion, to actually be a king. And you cannot realize that fulfillment apart from him. You can't. It cannot happen. God the Son has redeemed you, redeemed me, to, re to redeem his children actually to be kings. That's found in Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Let's read it as we close. Revelation chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. You know, the book of Revelation uh, it's not often talked about, but there is so much wonderful good news in the book of Revelation. So Revelation 1, 5, and 6 says this, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So do you think He's making us kings and priests for this earth? 
He's making us, he's preparing us to be kings when he comes to take his children home. On that, on that glorious resurrection day and the blessed hope when he rises those who are righteous from their graves and those who were alive at the time who are righteous will be raised and meet them and meet Christ in the Lord. And we will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. And in God's kingdom, his children will be kings. Amen. And you know something? Christ is our king. And because he is our king, we want to share that glorious good news to this lost and dying world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today as we dig a little bit deeper into the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Father, we thank you that you have given us light on this area, that we may understand what it truly means to be poor in spirit, to recognize our great need for a risen Savior. Recognize our great need that without Christ, we are nothing. Without him, we are nothing. Without Jesus, we are lost. Help us to recognize our sinful ways. Help us to repent. Help us to turn from this old man of sin and walk in newness of life only by holding the precious hand of Jesus, only by turning to him in every given situation, in every single minute of this life that you have given to us. Thank you, Father, for being with us. Thank you, Father, for opening your word to our hearts. Thank you for the spirit as it moves upon us that we may make these decisions for Jesus. And all the brothers and sisters said, Amen and Amen. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.